first of all, I want to get away from the dictionary definition of a constitution. A constitution must have purpose and the purpose must be to create a nation that conduces to the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people. That is what a constitution must be. And having set the objective of the constitution, you then frame a constitution to achieve that objective. Because we really do have a race problem. Those divisions are real. We see it in our politics. We see it in our trade union. We see that they take the divisions with them. Look at where people live in this U.S. You have enclaves in, in the Bronx and, and in Richmond Hill and in, and, and in Brooklyn. They're taking the division with them. Women are dying in the streets and we have a government pontificator running around campaigning for women's vote. No women should vote in this election coming up unless there is something done to the legislation as Magistrate Kim is advocating. That voices like ours that are not in the political trench fighting it out, voices like ours should um, become stronger. One of the things about the Caribbean is that we have never had one discourse. Bass will know the days of the new world and the old world and the radical left and, 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 and so on. What we had was this concourse of ideas, which I think in the early days of independence pushed, up, pushed us in, in a certain direction. We've got to move back to that point of having these multiple discourses To all our viewers, thank you for tuning in. A pleasant good morning to each and every one of you. Ladies and gentlemen, in light of today's discussion and in light of our team, I'd like to share one quote with you. Former Secretary General of the United Nations once said, when young people have decent jobs, political weight, negotiating muscles, and real influence in the world, they will create a better future. So. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Diane Madry, who will continue. Thank you so much, Stephen. Good morning, viewers, and thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, our first program for um, August with Let the Women Speak. So thank you for joining us and coming in with this um, very important segment as we uh, celebrate international International uh, Youth Day, which is actually um, scheduled for Monday, but uh, Globespan, together with uh, Let the Women Speak, is partnering to um, bring this presentation to you in this segment, this important segment. So today, as you know, Globespan brings together the three Ds, the dialogue, the debate, and the discussion, and we are going to be doing that with our young people today um, on some very important topic. So today's topic is uh, changing the geopolitical landscape through education and empowerment. And the uh, UN's theme for this year, 2019, is transforming education. So this segment will begin to ex ex examine the geopolitical landscape of our Caribbean youth and young people here in the United States and also in Guyana. Um, the question that I asked in, in preparation of this uh, with our team is, are they capable of sparking a movement to change this landscape? So I'm asking you, our viewers, and those in our audience, to join, join me with these dynamic individuals who will help me to answer uh, this particular question as we celebrate International Youth Day. What are your thoughts? Um, you, the audience, can participate in this conversation, and let's see how we can together, together, as I said, find the solutions. So, um, before we begin, and I introduce you to our guest, I apologize. Two of our representatives, our youth representatives in Guyana, um, had some other um, uh, prior commi um, commitments that uh, happened, and unfortunately, cannot be with us. And that's Vishal Bikar, the chairman of the NDC. He will not be with us today, and Alyssa Ferguson, who is a counselor for the municipal, can't even say that, um, for, for, for uh, Georgetown. So those two individuals will not be with us today, but filling in in Guyana, and I want to thank Samantha Shipasad, uh, 
who is a youth ambassador amongst many things, and she is also part of a program that's just launched called Guyanese Girl to Code. So we're going to start, and I'm going to ask um, Tameshwar Badu to be the first one. Can you introduce, take a minute, introduce yourself to our viewers? Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Tameshwar Badu. I've spent my entire life in education, at least 20 of those years in Guyana. I'm currently a PhD student in curriculum instruction and assessment at Wallen University. Um, and this topic is very dear to me as an educator, um, you know, empowering our young people through education and through, polit through politics um, will change the way we, we think, the way we progress, and the way we generally interact on a daily life. Thank you. Uh, Richard David. And Richard, uh, for our viewers um, tuning in, uh, Richard is um, one of our young adults, uh, young adults from our right here in New York. And I'll let Richard tell you a little bit about himself. Richard? Good morning, Diane. I'm really honored to be here um, to talk about, in advance of International Youth Day, how young people, I think, can get more empowered both in their local communities here in New York and uh, in Guyana and perhaps around the world. Um, I was actually born in Guyana and I came here when I was 10 years old. And it's been an incredible journey since then. Um, currently, I'm a Democratic district leader here in Assembly District 31. I have the honor of representing the single largest Guyanese community anywhere in the world, except in Guyana. Although some people say there are more Guyanese people here in New York uh, than outside of New York. Um, in addition to that, I'm a professor at uh, York College, and I help young people to access their own history. And I teach about how we decolonize education so that young people especially can claim their history and tell their own stories and that it's prioritized in the conversation. Uh, before we move to Samantha, Richard, you had mentioned to me in our conversation that ed education is one of your uh, campaign um, areas that you're covering. So we're going to touch on that when we come back. So Samantha, can we get um, share with our viewers, uh, for those who don't know who Samantha Shepetsad is? Thank you very much, Diana. It's such a privilege. Uh, good morning, everyone, and happy International Youth Day in advance. It's such a privilege to share the audience with uh, my fellow Guyanese. Um, for those who don't know uh, Samantha Sherpashad, I was the Queen's Young Leader 2017 for Guyana and now the CARICOM Youth Ambassador. I have several other titles. I will not support right now, but as a youth advocate, I believe that education is very important and is one of the tools that we need to use to empower our community to transform that type of change that we definitely seek out to. And most of the time when we work on the ground as an advocate, as a youth leader, it is education that is always the tool that is empowering our young people. And I believe this time is a critical time that our nation needs and our young people need political will and political empowerment. Thank you so much, Samantha. And before we continue, can you step back a bit? I want everyone to see that T-shirt because it was important um, when we're talking about our youth. So it says, <laughs> yeah, mental health matters. So that's important yes. because in, in this whole youth movement, that's part of it as well. And Samantha, I know you work on a lot of issues on mental health empowerment. So we'll talk about that as we'll talk about that as well. So as we continue, viewers, again, my name is Diane Madre, and thank you so much for joining us on this um, segment of Let the Women Speak. As a disclaimer, may I say this to you? Um, myself and and uh, any of these individuals here that are joining me, we're not here campaigning for any political party in Guyana. So please. Uh, there's no hidden agenda, so do understand that. I know sometimes criticisms come about, and I usually just let it float over. But um, whether my experience or not with any political party, this is not a hidden agenda uh, regarding any race or uh, political party for today's segment. Those of you who know my work um, through Guyana and the Caribbean, it's primarily with youth and women. So, and um, today, I'm honored to say that even though it's Let the Women Speak and it's Samantha and I, um, we have uh, the men in our space. And I, I'm honored to have these guys here because it's so important uh, when, when men support our women, right? 
So we thank allies. you. We're happy to, I'm happy to be here. And I'm also happy to be here. And thank you both for supporting gentlemen. And uh, Samantha, thank you. She's our goddess in the mix, right? So, um, <laughs> so why don't we begin with, with uh, some of the questions that uh, together uh, some of our, um, my teammates had helped me put together in terms of uh, looking at how we can transform this particular landscape. And as I said, Richard represents the United States um, and here in New York and elections are going to be coming up. So, and this is not uh, necessarily to campaign for Richard as well, but it's an important topic for our young people about voting and stuff and Richard will talk about that. So the first question, I'm going to throw this out gentlemen and uh, um, Samantha. And then, you know, we can either go around or, but try to make the answers as quick so we can move along and cover as much as we can uh, today. So the first question is, why should youth participate in politics? And, why are the, and what are the benefits of their involvements? So why should youths participate? And what are the benefits of their involvement? I'm happy to start. OK. You know, young people are running some of the largest companies in the world today, whether it's Facebook or social media um, companies, it doesn't matter. The only space that young people, I think, have really been locked out of is politics. And this is where we need to claim it, because at least in the United States, when you talk about excessive tuition, young people are saddled with that. Mm -hmm. When you talk about access to um, public health, it's young people who are saddled with that. When you talk about how resources are distributed, especially in New York, we say communities of color, because the issues that we mm -hmm. face in New York, although we all pay taxes, those revenues are not spent equally in New York City. And young people continue to be locked out of that process. I'm happy to be a voice, not just for young people, but also to actually give them the tools so that we can all get involved in politics um, mm -hmm. together. And thank, thank you so much, absolutely. Thank you so much for saying that, Richard. And for our viewers, I am not campaigning for Richard, but I do want to say I've watched this um, gentleman grow up in the last 10 years um, from a youth to, to, the, to the young man he is today. So I've seen his transformation um, through youth development and now community development. So this is very important. And one of the things that I do want to add, it really impresses me as an elder um, amongst our young people to see when young Guyanese migrate here like you, Richard, and um, take up spaces um, and seats at the table. I agree with you and you know I don't just talk to talk when I came to New York when I, and I graduated from college one of the things that the first things I did with my friends is we created an organization that helped young people to graduate from school we live in a neighborhood that I said is the largest mm -hmm. Guyanese community the graduation rate here was less than 50 percent in fact we've lost a generation of young Guyanese people that look just like you and me who haven't even finished high school so it's the graduation level among Guyanese in New York is actually lower in New York than it is in Guyana. Mm. And so we've lost a generation of Guyanese even here in New York, and we've actively worked directly holding every one of these young people that we can get our hands on to ac actually help them to get through and make sure that they go to college. Not everyone goes to college, but we also encourage them to get into technical trade programs or just to get a job so that they can grow into wholesome young people. Thank you so much, Richard. So as we continue, and I'm going to go to our other two panelists, I want to remind you that you are part of this conversation. So we're asking you, as you're tuning in, and again, I'm here with you, Diane Madre. We have Tameshwar Badu, and we have Richard David right here in New York. Samantha Sipasad coming in from our studio, from our Glowspan studio in Georgetown, Guyana. So um, we're going to scroll our telephone numbers on screen, so please feel free to call in the numbers and questions and comments that you can provide in support of International Youth Day. Thank you so much. So um, the question again, should young people participate and, and the benefits? Tamesh, um, what about you? Yes, Diane. Um, our young people, um, the research has shown that on Global Voice for young people that only one, a, a fifth of our world population of young people have been participating in politics um, and get involved in taking public offices. Um, and this trend needs to be shift because if we're preparing our young people, we're saying that our young people are our future, why are we not transitioning them to take up the political space um, that needs to um, take up the transition that are required for them? So one of the, the 
the facet for that is education. Um, I remember years ago in Ghana, we used to have what we call a civic life and ethics education curriculum yeah, that were offered that. in school where our young people were taught some level of politics um, in, in, in education, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial arm of government. Um, and today, what happened is that we do not have a civic life and ethics curriculum that is offered in a Guyanese context, and therefore, we're losing our young people. And if our young people are locked out of politics, therefore, we're locking them out of the process of democracy. We're locking them out of the process of important decision making. And so it is important that we educate them along that line. Okay. Uh, quick question to that, what you said. You mentioned about um, the civic um, program that was being provided. Yes. That was in the high schools, or what was that? Um, if my memory served me right, it was provided for at all school age level. Okay. Um, the only institution that currently offer a course on civic life and ethics currently is the Teachers Training College, college. in Guyana, so a part okay. of College of Education, and I must commend them mm -hmm. for that because okay. it, it brings to the forefront the importance of young people in political transition mm -hmm. through education. Okay. I right. just, if I can yeah, just add sure. to that, you know, I think it's okay for young people to not wait yes. and to just take those chances. Um, because the other thing that you have is sometimes young people are involved, but we're not in a leadership position. And so I've certainly not waited for anyone. I don't encourage anyone to wait your turn. I encourage people to take your turn and to mm. do what you think is right and bring your best ideas to the table, just like everyone else, regardless of your age. Absolutely. Take your turn. I like that, Richard. Um, Samantha, uh, can we come to you on that? So why should you, uh, youth participate in politics and what are the benefits of that involvement? Also, can you add what... Um, Tamesh said about that civic um, program, did you, because I know you're a bit younger than um, the others, so did you experience that as well? Uh, the civic education uh, is being done by the youth department and it's filtered down within youth groups and youth organization. That is what I would have experienced. Um, I'm not sure if there is currently uh, civic education that is happening right now because I haven't experienced anything of that uh, recently. But so you didn't, you didn't have that in school, that, like what he, uh, Tamesh was saying? No, I didn't experience okay, so that in school at all. Yeah. Okay. Nothing, nothing of that sort um, mm -hmm. in, in school. So, but to respond yeah. to your question uh, that you just asked, um, I believe that 60% of our uh, voters' population is young people. And oftentimes, we are seen as the statistics rather than the stakeholder in solving issues and key issues that are affecting young people. And most of the time, the decisions that are made by older persons are directing to us and will certainly affect us whether negative or positive and sometimes we we believe that there is not much consultation that is held on social issues that are affecting young people and these decisions are just made haphazardly with us being at the table so what i would encourage young people all the time if you are not at the table take the chair and put it at the table and show up and represent <laughs> your voice if you must because most of Absolutely. the time, most of the time, young people, when you say so, this is happening, or this is happening to me, and it seems like you're attacking them, no, you're trying to tell them, well, there is a problem here, and we need to fix the problem. And when you give them context of the problem, they believe that, okay, uh, you're trying to make them look bad. So they try to eliminate you out of the discussion. But oftentimes, you have to be radical, you have to be real, and you have to get to that table. And, and make sure you get time, that it chair. Doesn't happen, it doesn't happen with you being a politician or get to that table as a politician. It, mm. it, it happens to you being a social activist. Absolutely, and that's where it starts, the activism. So um, uh, next question, uh, guys. Why is political education, I think you answered that to some degree, but let's expand on that. Why is political, ex political education important for young people? Richard, let's start with you, because I know with us growing up here, and you growing up here, and the education in school, um, and since education is also on your platform, let's start with you on that question. 
I think actually the biggest harm that we do when we talk about politics um, is how we react um, to politicians. I think, I can't tell you how many rooms I walk into and someone will say to me, oh, he's a politician, let's not let him <laughs> speak, or he's here for some other agenda. The longer we continue to do that, the longer we continue to make politician a bad thing, in any career there is good and bad, it's I think what you make of it, the harder it will be for young people to want to be politicians. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's important to be a politician is because you get to decide how your community is run. You get to, if you're a good politician, engage in deep consultation and engagement with the people that you're working with. Now, when we talk about education, that's a big part of it, just the psychology of what a politician means. But also, um, some of the rules, like in democracy, there are a lot of rules, and we gotta know how, to, we gotta know how those rules work, mm -hmm. and then we gotta learn those rules, and we gotta play to win. I think that's the only way that we can do it. And I think Samantha's absolutely right. We have to be radical. In being radical, though, I don't think anyone's talking about burning down the house or throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. I think what we're talking about is taking control of the things that we think is right. And I think with that, there are two words. There's a difference between being assertive and being aggressive. So it's not being aggressive and, as you said, you know, protesting and burning things down, you know? There's, a, there's room for protest and civil yeah. disobedience, um, but, I, but I think you're right. I think there's, there's a separation between that and destruction of public property and right. those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, Tamish. Hi. Um, so, for me, education, political education is important because it allows you to understand the role of democracy and what democracy does for the society. Um, it is also important for our young people to be educated because many a times in the Guyanese society, this is what I hear as an educator moving around, I am voting because I still have to work. Well, young people, I want you to understand this and understand this coming from an educator, that your voice and, and true democracy can only be heard through your vote. And for you to do that, you need to understand the process and the importance of that. And so education is the only way forward in moving our society ahead. For example, we, we're going into a, a, going through a political um, motion right now in Guyana. Um, when the no confidence motion came, and I'm not speaking as a politician here, I do not take a political stand, I'm just trying to put it in real term. How many of our young people understand what the term majority or absolute majority means? And so many a time, as Samantha pointed out, we, our young people are left out in the decision making. And in order for us to earn a chair or a seat at the head table, we need to educate ourselves. We need to understand that these are policies that are being presented that will affect our lives forever, maybe five, six, seven generations ahead. And how do we change that? We change that through educating ourselves, through understanding the policies that are thrown to us and, and how do we negotiate better policies, better programs, um, better fit for us as young people in the society. Great points, gentlemen. Uh, Samantha, how about you? Why is political education important for our young people? I want to add, uh, before I answer, I want to add to uh, Tamish as well. Uh, not just young people, but if, you are, if you're a female, if you're a woman, if you're a girl, it also makes mm. it difficult for you to be a part of decision-making process. Because during my process becoming a youth leader, becoming a leader, I've experienced tons of uh, turn down uh, from the opposite sex because I was... I was, a, I was seen as a woman, the one who wears a skirt. They should not listen to anything that I have to say. So that's, that's a challenge by itself, you know, when you have to voice your concern. Okay, so I agree with you on that. And um, to add to you, to what you just said, Samantha, it's so important because even with this, um, you know, our platform of Let the Women Speak, yes, we have men at the table right now. You know, yeah. but getting young women also to participate in stuff like this, sometimes it's also difficult. And you all said, you know, it's time. You don't wait for, for it to come to you. You have to go out and get it. 
so. you know. So, Samantha, um, you're going to answer that question. Why is political education uh, important for our young people? I believe that education is the cornerstone to any country's national development. And political education is key right now because with all that is happening in our world, we are, tar we are projecting to 2030 goals. And with Guyana signing on to that and being a part of that, we need political will to save our planet and to save our country and to provide better opportunities for our young people. And in doing so, we need to have political education. And that will, be, that will provide the political will to making the decision that will help to build a future that our young people so deserve. So, um, touching on the issue of, of gender, I want to emphasize this to yeah. all, that a, a woman's right is a human right. And so when we support young people in, in aspiring for, for public offices, for um, promotion of um, um, non-governmental organization, activism, and what have you, we need not see the individual by their gender. We need to see the work that they're putting forward. And I, as, as an educator, I have always advocated that a woman's right is a human right. And therefore, we should not see one, a, a man, um, in a different space than a woman. We're all human, and therefore, our rights are all human rights. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. So did anyone in the audience would like to add to that? Uh, Stephen, would you like to? Um, you want to uh, stand up? Good morning again. Um, Come back over. My name is Stephen, actually, and um, I am the director for Youth for Human Rights International in Guyana. I'm also a youth ambassador, and I've been representing Guyana at the United Nations for the past four years. With regards to the topic at hand, I've had the privilege um, of you know being politically involved and you know having first-hand knowledge with regards to everything that we're discussing here today it just so happened that by the time i was 23 24 i became an elected councillor on the regional democratic council for region three and then subsequently um a councillor on the neighborhood democratic council back there in guyana um, with regards to education and the, the issue of young people becoming involved, I believe for far too long, and this is just piggybacking on what your panelists uh, has said earlier, I believe for far too long young people have been uh, marginalized and disconnected from mainstream politics and mainstream decision making in our country. And um, this does no good. As Samantha and the others have said, at the end of the day, it is incumbent upon government to make policies and have these policies, you know, installed in the country. But what young people need to realize is that these policies affect us in some way or the other. And it therefore, it is absolutely imperative that our voices be heard when it comes to decision making. With regards to education, um, uh, political education, so, so to speak, uh, Tamishwar mentioned um, a bit about it. In Guyana, young people are exposed to their first glimpse of education as it relates to the political structures in Guyana, which has to do with the with our executive arm, the legislative arm, and the judicial and the, judi the judicial arm, and how these arms are independent to each other and how they function in the whole structure there of Guyana. But that at that age, it is just a superficial knowledge just a, a very f a foundation, you know, fundamental information on how the political, the political structure works there in Guyana. But it is absolutely important with all that's happening in our country for us to be cognizant as young people as to everything that we see being played out in our country. How fully do we understand everything that we see on the news and that we see on every broadcast and everything that we read how fully do we understand it we, you will find and this is an issue with with um guyanese in as much as we can read how much do we understand that we read and therefore yeah. it is absolutely important that we fully understand as young people 
the things that are happening, the things that we read, and the things that we see before we're able to make very informed decisions. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be some form of political education, not just mm -hmm. where those at a tertiary level can understand, but every single young person in Guyana understands because at the end of the day, they all vote, even those who might not be able to understand what mm -hmm. the policy will bring to them. And so it is important that systems be put in place, and this is where our voices come in. We have to serve as the advocate where we understand, but we serve as that advocate where we can therefore disseminate the knowledge to mm -hmm. you know, our, our community members and our community young people at the grassroots level. Thank you so much for saying that because it comes to the next question that I have, and I'm gonna throw this out to all of you. Um, you as well, Stephen. You're going to pass that? So, um, and uh, Samantha, so at this particular moment, since we're celebrating International Day uh, for youth, and it's also about um, transforming education. So you can take a minute as, uh, as uh, we go around with each of you. Um, let's look at uh, solutions, right? What are the curriculum that we can probably think Richard um, could be here in New York looking at our Caribbean community, um, our youth here, based on the information that you had said earlier, and uh, for our, our youth for Guyana, looking at that as well. So what curriculum um, might you suggest that uh, we can use or we can suggest to our um, you know, politicians or political leaders that can address the, um, political, political education for youth? Uh. All right, so I'll, I'll take the lead on this one because curriculum is my um, baby area. Um, now, in order for us to develop a curriculum to address the issue of why political education, um, I want to touch on something that I saw. Um, I was listening to a debate in the St. Lucia Parliament where the St. Lucian parliamentarian, there is a French Patois community, and the St. Lucia parliamentarian presented his debate in the Queen's English. And you know what he said? He said, Madam Speaker, would you permit me to present the same debate in the French Patois so my constituent can mm -hmm. understand? I'm saying this to say that when we develop curriculum to address political education, the words, the, the subject matter, the content matter of that curriculum should be so designed that it address to the needs of the society in Guyana. The language should be that, that even a 10 year old can pick it up, read, interpret, and explain to someone to say, this is what democracy means. This is what a constitution means. This is what a political debate is. This is what a geographical constituency is in Guyana. So therefore, um, for me, a civic life and ethics curriculum mm -hmm. would address- to bring, to bring that back, based to, on what to, you said. To bring it back. We need mm -hmm. to have a civic life and ethics curriculum. and. In, in our school, starting as early as our primary school. Um, two youth movements where our young people are going into our community, and these do not have to be politically affiliated. I know um, our political parties have youth arms, um, but those youth arms, many people who are not politically affiliated with any political party, but just show up to vote on election day, do not reach out to those political parties or they're not involved in many of those activities to be educated politically. So the non-governmental organization and, um, or um, social activists are the people to take the curriculum, the um, civic life and ethics curriculum, go into community, have bottom house um, sessions, um, you know, whole town hall meeting and, and break it down to the language of the people. Because if you are able to speak the language, they're going to understand. And I can share from personal experience as a lecturer at the teacher's training college. We have students coming in from all over Guyana. And many a times our young people came with a Creole background, including myself. And 
you know, we go to the classroom as lecturers and we, we present in, in standard, some level of standard English. And many a times, our young people, as much as they have five or 10 subjects, CXC, um, the comprehension skills is missing. And so therefore, sometimes I have to break it down in the local dialect for young people to get it. And I think that's the missing gap between what is happening in education and our young people. We need to, to educate our young people as English as a second language. Mm. So the first language or curriculum for political education need to be developed in, in our local Creole context that our young people can read and interpret and therefore have a better understanding. Mm. Thank you. Okay, Richard. Um, the the first thing I, th I think that um, I'd be interested in doing, and this um, is both here in New York um, and in Guyana, is to lower the voting age. Um, I, th I, don't, I think that it's important for 16-year-olds to vote. I think it's hmm. important for 17-year-olds to vote. I think that we, the earlier that we can get people involved, um, the more meaningful it is. But when we talk about education, I know today's program is about youth. I think political education, though, is um, across age groups. I think mm -hmm. although folks are older, um, the information that they would learn and they would need um, about civic engagement is equally um, important and probably more relevant. The way that I would do it is probably a little different. I'm a big believer in hands-on <laughs> politics and hands-on learning. Um, I don't think that something like, I think there's a role for in-class um, teaching, but I think what we've seen through amazing revolutions and organizing movements, both politics and outside of politics, is deconstructing power and understanding how power relates to other aspects of your life and who the stakeholders are in every situation. I think the more that we can deconstruct power and give people the tools to understand and assess risks and to understand um, consequences, we would be better able to help them actually do this. And I think that it could happen in the classroom, but I've seen it more being more successful outside of the classroom. And I've seen it be incredibly successful when regular people have this information at their disposal. And so the means that we're communicating it, one is the classroom, but we have the internet. There's no reason why people couldn't look at this curriculum online, access these tools online. And so the tools for social change should be there. They should be templates. And that's how I think that we can get education, both to young people, um, not and in Guyana, in the Caribbean, but also across different age groups where I think it's most relevant. I think you and Tamesh need to team up on, on this idea of um, you know, the, voter, the voter's <laughs> registration. The voter's registration, you know, especially, you know, maybe, I'm not saying it's not impossible to have it done here, to lower the, lower the age, but maybe possible you guys taking this to Parliament and see if there's a possibility of lowering the age for Guyana to get more youth involved. So I, I, I like um, that. I like that idea. Yeah, um, youth participation because um, 15, 20 years from now, they're the ones that are going to be taking the seat yeah. Richard and I have, right. you know, and so it's important for yeah. their participation in the decision-making process. Uh, and and uh, we have a comment from Suresh Sagrim. We need to hold our politicians uh, responsible. So I agree with that. And he mentioned earlier that um, uh, for uh, yeah, we are ready to hold them accountable. Are we going to? Uh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right, Sir, Suresh. So, we're gonna answer that question. I think we we have a question to address the issue of accountability and transparency in good governance. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. F thank you for saying that. So um, let's move on to uh, Samantha. Samantha, in terms of what are your thoughts on if we were to create solutions, and we're talking about this openly now, and uh, with the situation, the political situation in Guyana, knowing that you are a youth ambassador, you represent, you represent Guyana on its whole, what, what is the curriculum change or, or implementation that you would want to see for political education, you know, particularly in the schools, as what um, the gentlemen's, you know, gentlemen have said. So first of all, uh, if we're going to implement a curriculum, I believe we need to have some form of consultation, and we need to have some form of research done to develop this curriculum that is going to provide us with voter education. And um, 
one of the other thing that we must do in preparing our young leaders is that we must have a program that cater for leadership, uh, political involvement, and guiding them through that process. Maybe an online course. We have technology uh, to mm -hmm. our advantage now. We need to use the technology to advance social change. And the thing is that going through the Queen's Young Leaders program, we were taught leadership, we were taught social change, we had mentors, we had coaches, we had debates, we had sessions where we were going to different uh, lecturers at the University of Cambridge discussing various topics that really, really um, enact leadership and change into young people. And I found that program to be one of the best thing that ever happened to me today as, as a young leader. And one thing I would love to do is to implement something uh, within our community uh, to have that social change uh, happen among our young people. Because I can tell you, I have my biases uh, against politics. I'm not comfortable with speaking about politics. And that's because of the kind of connotation that I have when it comes to politics in Guyana. How do I view politics in Guyana? How I've been viewing politics? Every time I think about politics, oh God, it's hurt my head. I don't want to think about it, right? And and every like like uh, Richard said, every time someone see a politician, they feel like, oh, hey, this is a bad person, right? So there is there is there is like an image painted there. But then the thing is that this is a problem, and it's 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 a social plague that is that is really really affecting us, and it's 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 showing in our political will right now to make certain decisions that should benefit our people, and we're not able to do that as a nation. And the thing is that I believe that young people um, in our school school curriculum, some way or form, we should include politics in our curriculum. Why? Because politics helps us to develop policies and policies transform through community, through countries and the world at large. And that is where we will have the kind of change and the kind of progress and prosperity we desire. Um, there's a, thank you so much, Samantha. So we have a comment from Ryan Jeffrey. Guyana is hard for the youth to get access to, co to a computer. So here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to put those of you here to the test. Um, and uh, ho hold that thought. I'm putting you all to the test because today, um, when we're talking about uh, the geopolitical landscape for Guyana, the United States, um, transforming education, you guys are the future generation of, you know, you know, the United States here, across the Caribbean. So I'm putting you all to the test in terms of getting together. We're going to have a conversation at the end of this because, Samantha, you brought up some good, you all brought up some excellent points. And I think, why do we have to wait? And here's what, as, as one of your elders, right, and uh, mentor, why do you all have to wait? Because you all said, take a seat. Richard, you said, you all said that. Why do you have to wait for government to implement some of these things, right? So. Can't we just go ahead and, and see how we can do? Samantha, you're, you're good with this kind of stuff. Can't we? And Tamesh, you're good with research. Richard, you want to get more involved in Guyana? Why can't we get together and put some of these things out that are accessible to our youth? So, um, I want to get the Guyanese community in New York more involved. <laughs> um, we have a population that's the second largest group in New York. The voting rate is less than 10%. Um, in Guyana, it's 60, 70, 80%. Guyanese people aren't voting here. I have such so, a task here. So can we find a way to implement something that can cover both Guyana and the United States? So, um, Go ahead. Um, I'd like to address, um, to, to touch on a topic Samantha. area from Samantha. Um, I, I would like to agree with you because as a researcher, I support the movement for the use of empirical evidence in developing anything any policy, any um, new document, any new legislation that is going to parliament, um, it should be dr done through the use of empirical evidence and not talk shop consultation, but broad based on the ground consultation where our youths have a voice. And I'd like to say to you, um, I'm happy that you mentioned the, the Queen's Youth um, Program. 
I'm also an elected member to the National Society for Leadership and Success through my work on my PhD program. Um, so I have completed an executive leadership and success course too. So it would be a good team for us to team up and, and develop probably some amount of work, maybe a video to start with in, in, in our local community to promote voter education to start with. But like what Richard? I want to add to um, a, a piece of that. Look, it happens in Guyana um, and it happens all over the world. Political education is so important to Guyana because, as Samantha said, you don't even have the tools to talk about race and politics. People choose to not talk about politics because we don't know how to. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to do it because when we do, it becomes explosives. It bec we cannot find ways to disagree where the origin of it isn't entirely race-based. And so we, the world has conquered this. In the United States, believe me, we have race division. Um, I would say that it's greater than um, it is in Guyana, but we have the tools to talk about it. We are educated about this process, and I think a similar stakeholder engagement process um, can and should happen in Guyana, and that's what a curriculum would do, and that's, how, that's why politics is important to teach. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, so as we are moving along with time, um, what's that? So, uh, yeah, I would Samantha. like to add uh, something before we move yeah. ahead. Um, Tamish and uh, Richard and uh, Diana, as you guys are seeking partnership to do something like this, uh, as to bring together um, a, a voter's education um, content, um, I have that space available for you to host that type of content and uh, the bandwidth also to broadcast that uh, internationally through my uh, tech space uh, company, Trifinity Solution, because we have developed an app that is going to basically teach things like leadership, peace development, and uh, we're looking at social issues. And with this here being something that is a very much needed tool, I believe that this is a prime mm -hmm. time that um, maybe I can step up on my end here and support this type of uh, initiative and it would be it would be it would be um, in an honor to be a part of something like this because I believe as a young people as a young person this type of education is much needed in Guyana um, may I add to that also for uh, as Richard said for our young people here in um, in New York and across the United States. So we need to get our voters, you know, um, Guyanese people who are coming here and, um, you know, just say, oh, that they're going to vote. They're not even registers and stuff. And I'm going to have Richard touch on that in the interest of time um, in terms of seeing how we can we can do something like that. And maybe, Samantha, this might be something that uh, we can incorporate Richard in for not just Guyana, but for New York and other parts of the United States where we can get voters out there and we can get more young people like Richard, who was born in Guyana, taking a seat at the table right here. You know? Go ahead, Richard. I th so Guyanese um, in New York don't feel the same um, loss or the same um, need to own this government. Um, there's nothing... I, so I'll give you an example. I go to I went to probably ten graduations and I was their speaker, and I looked around the auditorium and probably seventy percent of the kids were Guyanese, and not only were they Guyanese, they were Indo Guyanese, mm -hmm. and so then I spoke to the PTA, that's the Parent Teachers Association, and they were also Guyanese. <coughs> so I asked them, do you guys do any kind of Guyanese education? Do you do anything that's culturally appropriate in a school that's the majority Guyanese? And they don't. Mm -hmm. They're still teaching Italian history. And it's, it boggles my mind because when we talk about how we get the Guyanese community to be involved in New York, the Guyanese community pays the taxes in New York. We just don't get any of the benefits from it. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that we understand what's at risk here, because the truth is the stake of Guyanese is also in New York and the future of Guyanese is also in New York, mm -hmm. and as much as it is in Guyana. Um, so, Richard, um, I, 
as an educator, there is one thing I always emphasize. If you want to strip a man of his identity, strip him of his culture. And that is what is happening in education. We're not transitioning our cultural education to our young people, and that is what is happening in, in, across the world. As a Guyanese, I, when I teach math, I'm a math teacher, I teach it with cultural relevance, right? I teach math overseas. I work in a, a country that has um, background of international business and tourism. Now, if I'm to teach as the textbook, Parak fashion, there is nothing other than creating robots, right? So what I do, I cultural appropriate that content to suit that environment. And so that is what needs to, to happen here in New York, even if it means for you to get the boys to sing devoted education in the chutney song and, and, beat the, and beat the tassa <laughs> drum and get it going. It's cultural appropriate. That is what the people gravitate to. But when you hear a statistic that 50% of the Guyanese students in New York aren't even graduating from high school, and you realize that it's lower than even Guyana, that should be alarming. And that's why I was proud to launch <laughs> the very first Indo-Caribbean history class at UR College. And people said to me, why is it Indo-Caribbean history and not Afro-Caribbean Afro history? Because Afro-Caribbean history had been in the college for 50 years. In fact, it's currently being taught there. And this history, your college, a lot of the students are actually Guyanese from this neighborhood. And that history had never been taught. And so for the first time, we got a class that's culturally relevant that includes this shared history and background into their curriculum for the first time. But and that's you're a teaching shame. It. And I'm teaching <laughs> it. But that's a shame because Guyanese have been living here since 1960. For that to happen when we're going into 2020, yeah. it's abysmal. It's shocking. And we're decades behind. And, and uh, right. it's the same thing with in a Guyanese context in terms of politics. Do we teach our political history? We, we, we have a rich political history of outside interference in, in, in politics, with geopolitical space. We, we're, we're sandwiched by Guyana, Brazil, and Suriname, with Venezuela being a, a political turmoil and a political pain to the Guyan, Guyanese Guyana's growth. Guyana's as England. It's not the size. It's our, mi growth, it's our mindset. Growth and development. OK. Oh, Malasek there. It's not just Guyanese, Richard. <laughs> There are Trini in your, okay, thank That's you. That's absolutely true. Yeah. So there thank are you, Indo Trinidadians, Indo Jamaicans, Indo Grenadians. Yeah. Um, but this broadcast, I understand, is focused to a Guyanese audience. And so that's why I'm talking um, about Guyanese. Actually, no, it's not just, it's not just Guyanese. Um, it's been expanding okay. uh, across the globe. It's so Trinidad, is it all Trinidadians, Indo yeah. communities, but yeah. Caribbean and West Indian communities, um, both Afro, Indo. In New York, we have. Um, Spanish people from the Caribbean, we have Chinese people from the Caribbean, and so that's why we got to be very specific. Right. Okay, so as we're, um, we're closing out, so we have, okay, uh, watching from England, thank you so much, Danita Bacchus, interested in informing, thank you so much. We have, uh, okay, so we've had some pretty good uh, responses, so um, as we wrap up, I should say, I'm going to pose one last question to our, um, to our panelists, and then I'm going to ask them, in the process of answering that question, you're going to um, close out with some of your last uh, comments, and we can check with the audience and see if there's any question, questions coming in from our viewers. Has there been any questions from our viewers that we need to answer? OK, so before I state that last question in our closeout, I want to indicate for Richard David, I am not here um, you know, pushing Richard or any political party. But you know, he's here. Thank, thank you so much, Richard, for coming and joining us in International Youth Day and transforming the education and the, uh, you know, looking at the political situation in terms of Ghana and across the Caribbean and seeing how we can come up with solutions. So I think you all came up with some excellent, excellent points. And I'm hoping that we can, outside of this dialogue, we can continue that conversation and maybe bring it back to this space. So on that note, I wanted to, um, in the next couple of months, and as Richard mentioned about, um, you know, voters uh, uh, within our community, how um, they're not coming out as much. So today, I really seriously, I'm hoping that this information was, was informative and that um, those of you who are living here in New York, um, Richard ran on, on another seat um, last year, and I think he was very close to winning. 
And here's what I'm putting out there to all of you. And I'm going to be here to support this. Um, Richard David is going to, you're going to see that elections coming up in a, in a few months. We don't know the date yet. Registration is still open for those of you who want to, who are citizens and would like to register to vote. So I'm going to have Richard mention that in terms of where people can go to register or, or um, where you can get that information. So I'm asking you and I'm telling you that your voice is important as well as anyone else, especially our young people. And uh, don't wait, as all of them said, don't wait for um, a seat to be pulled up. You know, you need to take a seat. As I said, I watched Richard grow up, you know, and from youth development to community development. Um, he was born in, in Guyana, so um, we can't say Richard for United States president, but guess what? Who is to say that maybe they said Tameshwar for education minister? Listen, we never know. Richard might say, hello, I'm coming back to Guyana to run for president, and I would love to see that, All right? So wouldn't you like to see somebody like Richard David for president of Guyana, maybe in 2030, when we're going to move this um, transformation? So on that note, please go to www.facebook.com, Richard David NYC, R-I-C-H. Um, can we hit that up on the screen? And the contact number for Richard, because he is running for this um, district leader. The number is 917-310-5148. Let me repeat that, 917-310-5148. And Richard's email, you can reach him at rich, R-I-C-H, David, D-A-V-I-D-N-Y-C, at gmail.com. And for anyone, okay, it's right up here. So for those uh, um, in the broadcast that um, please share this information, we need to get New Yorkers out to vote. Listen, I want to see Richard David um, win this uh, seat uh, in the next couple of months for District 31. So I'm not registered to vote in New York. So those of you who are registered to vote, listen, if I got to get you, you know, out there, if I got to drive you, Call me, let me know, okay? So please make sure that you are registered to vote in New York for this upcoming election so Richard could get that seat at the table. Uh, his voice matters and our community matters here in New York. So on that note, uh, one last thing, uh, business in terms I wanted to mention is that I'm also part of uh, a team with a good brother friend of mine, um, Ravi uh, Bipat who works with New York Life, and uh, we started doing this um, summer mixer. It's a uh, Queen's Professional Networking that we started it. We had our first one, Ravi, in July, right? And it was so successful. Um, I didn't expect we were going to have such a turnout. It was about, we had about 30 people um, show up at the Ross Code Lounge, which was the first time I experienced that. Richard, you, you, um, you were there. Uh, you showed up for that. So our next one is going to be hidden out. We want to encourage young people coming into these spaces as well. August 21st from 6 to 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the Roscoe Lounge. And um, I want to commend the owners of Roscoe because uh, it's, it's really a nice space uh, to, to meet and it's not, trust me, it's not a rum shop. So I'm encouraging, <laughs> I'm cu encouraging um, those of you, uh, please show up on August 21st so we can do more things and like supporting Richard for this District 31. Listen, Richard is going to win this next election. Do you hear me? Okay. All right. Our next question. And as we close out, where do you see yourself in the next five to 10 years continuing on this political path or your journey? So not necessarily because to make sure I don't know if you, you're on a political path, but that's okay. And even Samantha, Samantha says, you know, politics gives her a headache. Listen, we're talking about getting women in the spaces, and by 2030, right, 2030, listen, y'all, don't be surprised if Guyana have a female president, okay? And we might be looking at her right here, Samantha C. Passat. So um, on that question, guys, so as we close out, can we, can we answer in your, in your um, closing comments? Where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years continuing on the political path or your journey? I'll, I'll take that first. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you, Diane. Thanks to Global Span for having us here today and share our thoughts on the topic of Caribbean youth um, in preparation for International Youth Day, the theme transforming education. 
as an educator um, in the next five to ten years, I see myself as a full professor at a university teaching um, in a faculty of education, more so curriculum with a lean to cultural education. Um, it is one of the area that is very dear to me. Um, I would also like to do some work in curriculum development, especially in the area of um, mathematics education in Guyana, um, so that our youths can benefit from what I have benefited from in, a, in terms of education in the Guyanese context. Um, so I would like to say in my closing remark that I want to encourage our young people to continue to read, continue to challenge yourself to take that seat at the table. I once held a political office, um, a political portfolio in Guyana where, like Richard, um, I contested for a geographical seat in the city of Georgetown. Um, I didn't win that seat, but I was elected as a um, proportional representative. Um, I spent three months in that, three to six months in, in, in that seat in the city of Georgetown. Um, it taught me so much. Um, I was able to see the, how democracy worked, um, what made democracy work, what didn't make it work. Right? And it all has to do with how knowledgeable you are with the policies and, and programs for any particular organizations you're in and your, your good, the goodness of your negotiation skill and where you're able to strike a balance and, and compromise so that the people of that community um, benefited. So um, I would like to, to say thank you to Diane and the rest of the panel here for having me to, on this program to share a voice for young people. I would like to also wish my brother, um, Richard David, all the best in, in, in his upcoming well, election. Well, you come back and help campaign um, for him. <laughs> I know it's a challenge, my brother, um, but rise to the challenge and you will win. Thank He's you. He's winning. He's winning. Richard. Thank you, Tamashar. Um, in five years, I love what I'm doing now. Hopefully, I'll be doing more of it. Well, I've seen you from... from for 10 years now and where you've come. So go That's on. That's right. Um, you know, so I was actually born in Myconi in Guyana. Um, and I love the work that I do. I hope that in five years, some of this work will expand beyond where I am right now in Queens. Um, and it'll touch the shores of Guyana and other places. Um, but in five years, I want to see more Guyanese people elected to in Queens where we're the yeah. second largest immigrant group. It's a shame that not a single Guyanese person is elected to public office today uh, mm -hmm. in Queens. Um, so I want to make sure for Guyanese voters who are out there, um, when you're registering to vote, you can go to DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicle, their website. You can register online. It takes less than five minutes. And when you're registering to vote, I hope you pick the Democratic Party. If you don't pick a party in New York, you're not allowed to vote. Um, it's a different system, and that's how it works here. So until the rules change, I hope that you'll pick a party. I hope you'll pick the Democratic Party. That's the party I'm a part of. And I'd be honored to have your vote. Going back to this topic of International uh, Youth Day and some of the incredible work that you've done um, in the period of time that I've known you, Diane, it's so important. And it's so important, especially in Guyana, uh, where Samantha is, because we have young people in Guyana who are yearning for an opportunity. And there are so many opportunities that we have in New York that are just not the same in Guyana. Mm -hmm. I hope that on International Youth Day this year and years coming forward, the promises of a bright future are as bright or brighter in Guyana as they are here in New York. Mm -hmm. And anything that I can do to be a part of that, I'm not just wearing this Guyana US pin for mm -hmm. show. I really feel like I'm Guyanese American because I'm a part of that experience and I want to make sure that opportunities are continuing to grow um, for Guyanese in Guyana. Mm -hmm. And I think Samantha said uh, something that we can look at so we can have that conversation. Stephen is here, uh, Stephen Singh, who is from Guyana as well, that um, I think is also important in this space. And I see the future of Guyana can be bright if, you know, all of you young people, as you clearly said right here, that, you know, don't wait, wait for the seat to be pulled up, you know, take it you know so um, Stephen yeah Dan like I said like to make sure um, 
I too held um, two politically appointed seats there in Guyana. And for come, quite come some time... Here. Come over here. Sir. Sorry. And for quite some time, I never saw myself as a politician. And then it dawned upon me the fact that I was elected to these two seats. The fact that I was elected to these two seats, it made me a politician. But in it all, I went to my high school and the motto for my high school was a Latin word, uh, word serviam, I will serve. And through all of these discussions and all of these talks, at the end of the day, that is what we do as, as politicians and as young people in political offices. We are there elected to serve the people in our communities, to serve our constituency, and that is the bottom line. We listen to their cry, we listen to what they have to say. Consultation is key, and we serve based on that. So where do I see myself in the future? I want to be able to serve the people of Guyana. Their integrity and their well-being is dear to my heart, and I want to be in a position where I can serve meaningfully and where I can make meaningful decisions that will benefit the people of Guyana. Okay, so um, they keep telling me that um, we're closing out on time, so I'm going to ask Samantha to quickly um, give your um, last um, closing statements. Where do you see yourself the next five to ten years from now? Uh, with one of the current situation that is uh, affecting our people, creating opportunities and finding employment, uh, in the next five years I see myself as a technologist who will be able to build solutions uh, to basically transform those type of problems that we are having. So giving back to the community and serving people, community development, that, that's somewhere uh, that, I, that I see myself. I really see myself in a, in, in a political office more so, but on a social technological uh, standpoint. So remember, um, Samantha, we have this recorded, right? <laughs> so yeah. we're gonna come back five years from now and see. Not so not as we clo out, closing out here, I want to thank all our um, participants, Samantha Sheepasad, for coming in. Thank you, Samantha, for um, taking the time and coming in and joining us last minute um, when we had other, the other two had other commitments that couldn't make it. So I so much appreciate, and I will continue to support you as, as you know, we've been doing. And uh, Tamesh Rabadu, I am so proud and impressed with having the opportunity to finally meet you in person and um, see where you are, are heading. Also, Richard David, Richard David, you know, you know, you have been, you, you so have much. been, Sucre and I, my, um, our baby. So to see you grow to this point, you know, you have my full support. I, I can't vote for New York. I, I don't know if I can, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and Stephen, I'm, I'm so impressed with you, young people. So on that note, I want to thank Globespan for giving us this opportunity, and to all our viewers and to our youth across Guyana, the Caribbean, and the United States. On Monday, happy International Youth Day, and it's transforming education. So I want to wish everyone well and a uh, great weekend. So on the last note, to our youths, be your own hero. Once you decide to do something, be unstoppable. All right, so thank you so much, and see you again soon. <laughs>